Hello everyone and welcome to Talking Business with me, Danny Pardo. After a few episodes where we've gone all around the world, we're bringing it back home on this one. We're bringing it back to Birmingham and the West Midlands with Casey Bailey, Birmingham Poet Laureate, teacher and so much more. So here we go, let's talk business with Casey. Hello everyone and welcome to Talking Business with me, Danny Pardo. We're chatting to Casey Bailey today. So uh, hello Casey, how are you doing? I'm living the dream, thank you. How are you? Ah, oh, very well. Thank you very much. Thanks for uh, spending the time to chat to us here today. Um, I, and I know that your name has been uh, bandied about Birmingham quite a bit. Uh, but for anybody who doesn't know who, who Casey Bailey is, uh, who is Casey? Um, I am a poet, a performer. I'm a teacher as well. Um, and I um, yeah, I'm the Birmingham Poet Laureate. I write music. I write theatre. Uh, just all kinds of random stuff really anything that lets me talk nonsense fantastic i mean but how do you have time to do all that i mean i'm a teacher and uh, <laughs> you know i'm struggling to find my time myself i mean how's your uh, your self-organization do you ever rest um yes it's not it's nothing to do with organization it's all about not resting at all ever at any point in time <laughs> um yeah i'm kind of always switched on i tend to leave work and i come home and i do well i do dinner and bedtime and then I do emails and writing and whatever whatever else it may be wow that that is quite a lot on your plate um very impressive <laughs> it's uh that, that's amazing so I mean how did you get to here then I mean what's your career journey you know when you were say 16 GCSE time yeah. or 17 18 did you think right I'm going to be Birmingham Pope Laureate I'm going to be a teacher I'm going to be writing and and starring in things you know is that is that the journey that you've been on or has it been kind of all over um, the place it has been a bit all over the place so weirdly um what one thing that has come full circle is when i was about 14 i thought i wanted to be a maths teacher um and i went and i did a level maths and for for reasons that weren't my behavior normally the reasons i, I dropped courses was my were my behavior but it wasn't this time um i stopped doing a level maths and i went and i went on to be a PE teacher but I now actually spend a lot of my time teaching maths. Um, but other than that, it's all just been a bit all over the place. So I uh, finished my GCSE. I went to college. Um, I did uh, sciences. I did chemistry and biology. Uh, and originally I did maths and PE. I finished chemistry, biology and PE. And I picked up psychology along the way and did A-level psychology. Um, and I went to uh, Worcester University and I did PE and sports studies. Uh, now, the reason I chose to go to the university is because my girlfriend was going to the university. Um, it was one of those like proper, uh, soppy, um, not very well thought out decisions. However, uh, she's my wife now. So that was solid. That worked out OK. Um, and I thought the course, you know, if you do GCSE PE and you do A-level PE, they are kind of like the equivalent of what a uh, university level sports studies course will be like. Mm -hmm. And I presume that degree level PE would just be an extension of that. But it turned out that degree level P was all around teaching P. So I remember being about six weeks into the course and uh, one of my lecturers saying, OK, we're going to have some eight year olds in in the next two weeks. You're going to plan a session and deliver it. And I was like, why am I teaching eight year olds? What's going on here? Um, and they were like, well, you, you are on a course around teaching, Casey. And I was like, oh, all right. Yeah, of course I am. <laughs> I do that. <laughs> um, and it just turned out to be the best thing. I coached. Um, Football, I coached the ladies' football team all the way throughout university. I came home every weekend and coached the team uh, in my local area. And just that kind of leadership and um, sport as a real driver for kind of cohesion, for social issues, for mental health, for all the things that sport can be really useful for, just really drove me to, to want to actually then pursue not just doing this course, but wanting to become a teacher myself. Uh, and yeah, so that, that kind of happened. And while that was happening, I was on uh, a bit of a hiatus from writing. So I wrote from about the age of maybe 10 or 11. I've always written things, whatever those things may be. And from about the age of 14, I was rapping. And at about 17 or 18, I realised that the rap music that I was making, that I thought was really reflective and eye-opening around what was going on in my area, was really just adding to the problem. So it was really just me in the end, perpetuating the issues that I thought I was trying to solve. Um, and that kind of culminated in a, in a boy who was a few years younger than me saying he'd done something they definitely shouldn't have done, 
and quote him one of my lyrics as the reason to why he'd done it. I was like, oh, this is not the impact I'm trying to have. Yeah. Uh, so for a long time, I just stopped writing. I was still passionate about it, but it just wasn't... Um, I, every time I tried to go back to writing, I was either writing about the same things or people were saying to me, oh, write about that stuff again. You know, write about this negative stuff. And I was like, I don't, I don't want to write about that. Um, so I literally just stopped writing. And it was when I started teaching in my second year of teaching, there was a group of predominantly boys, but there were one or two girls in the group who just weren't engaging with English. Mm. And I'd been given a, a role specifically around behavior by that point quite early in my career. And so I was asked to pick up this group and do literacy work with them, which to me was great. I was like, amazing. Um, so I started what I called Bailey's Rap and Poetry Club, which was like the acronym of BRAP Club. And they would come and we would write poems and raps. And I would say, right, for next week, I want to rap about um, the process of a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. But I want you to use simile four times. I want you to use two metaphors. Mm -hmm. And they started then saying, well, so we want you to write a rap about something. And so I started writing again to like work with these students, to give a bit of give and take with these students. Yeah, yeah. And then just my passion for it all just kind of came back and somewhere along the line I became the Birmingham Poet Laureate and an wow. assistant head teacher and maths teacher and love all it. of the fun stuff. Love it. I mean, if, if such a big passion of yours then was like the writing and the music and that creative side then, how come you didn't carry on to study those? Because a, a lot of people then, you know, and a lot of advice we give to students nowadays is that follow your passions and yeah. if that's what you're interested in. So, how you know, if, if that was such an interest to you, why, why the PE and, and maths route then? Uh, yeah, there's a, I think there's a couple couple of reasons. One, uh, I'm one of those weird people who actually really likes maths. Um, so, so for a start, like I enjoyed maths. Felt I like it was fun to go to maths. Um, wasn't always fun for my teachers, but I always had fun going to maths. Uh, and I and I love sports. I'm not very good at sports. I'm one of those PE teachers who's not very good at sports, uh, which is quite rare. Um, but I, I, you know, I can get by at an average level kind of okay that's my level of sports <laughs> um but but I was also I did also do uh, there's a couple of reasons why I didn't follow the other route so I had to choose GCSE drama or music yeah. and at the time music was all about learning uh, instruments and the technological side of music which w wasn't really where my passion lay so I chose drama and I passed my uh, drama practical exam with flying collars and didn't hand in any coursework so I failed GCSE drama um, and GCSE English, um, which is really where my other main passion lay in, in writing and reading. Uh, I uh, do predominantly to, to my own behaviour, uh, although I'm not as, as someone who now teaches, I'm not um, a fan of the way that I was handled. Um, but due in, in many ways to my own behaviour, I wasn't actually allowed to go to English for the whole of year 11. I wasn't allowed in the lessons. Um, I still passed English. Um, but they, they took me out of the lessons and they put me onto the foundation paper. So I couldn't go on to anywhere that was that was doing A-level English or A-level English literature and say, I want to get on the literature course because they uh, say, well, you got a grade C. And I would say, or well, what would I say? Yeah, because I was too naughty to stay in the class. It's exactly. not really a solid argument. To not really. Me. No, that's not going to get um, you any further, <laughs> is it? <laughs> that will oh, put yeah. up more walls. <laughs> it's not that you can't do English. It's that you're naughty. So that was... Yeah, exactly, yeah. Naughty um, case. So I just... No um, and, and I did chemistry and biology because also I really enjoyed I really enjoyed a lot of school really once I picked my sub my options um, you know a lot of, uh, of kids are unfortunate in that you know you have a broad range of options but really if they could they do they do two of them you know they, they go right I want to do I want to do art and I want to do history and I don't really want to do anything else yeah. but I loved sciences found sciences really interesting did uh, woodwork was, was wasn't very good at woodwork but enjoyed it um so I, I pretty much enjoyed all of my subjects so I could have went on I would have gladly went on and done uh, sciences at university level I would have gladly went on and done um maths at university level if, if different things hadn't have happened at college so um yeah all, all of them were were things that I was passionate about and I always give the same advice to to kids who I teach you know, do what you love doing, because ultimately on the days when you've got to get that big piece of homework in and you really don't want to do it, it doesn't matter how good you are at a subject, 
just being good at it is not always enough to make you go, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll put the work in. But if you enjoy it and you're passionate about it, you're going to want to do that work. You're going to want to do it to the best of your ability. Yeah. And I mean, there's no way, you know, we started off by saying how busy you were. If you didn't enjoy what you were doing, there's no way you'd be, you'd be, we'd be doing this on a Friday night and you'd be spending the weekend doing it. You know, it, it's as simple as Absolutely. that, isn't it? It's like, well, I have to do this all my hours. Well, no, I'm just not doing it. Yeah. But you're, you know, obviously you've got that love for it. Um, Absolutely. It'd, yeah, it'd be a bit silly of me. One brought me to another here then. Um, it'd be a bit silly not to mention the Commonwealth Games coming up next year. Um, what, what do you think the games are going to bring to Birmingham? Um, so I'm actually, I'm on the uh, legacy and benefits um, board for the Commonwealth mm. Games but because, you know, I had all this free time. I thought, why not? That's um, it, yeah. <laughs> you must have had 10 minutes somewhere you thought, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> That's in there. Um, I, think, I think it's worth me saying that in many ways, I'm not necessarily um, an advocate of the overall idea of the Commonwealth Games just because oh, they're born out of the Commonwealth and I'm not, and, and I'm not a fan of uh, the Commonwealth and, and everything that it represents. However, for me, the reason I wanted to be involved is it's a major um, event coming to Birmingham and it's an event that's going to shape the infrastructure of the city. It's going to shape the economy in the city and it's going to have an impact on the lives of people who live in the city. Uh, and when you look at some games like um, Athens, um, when you look at the impact that, that Athens had on that city, it was horrendous. And, and you had stadiums that were built that that millions and millions of pounds were pumped into and then they were never used again and you just think what a waste and, and roads redeveloped and people's houses knocked down and all this stuff for nothing in terms of longevity and what I hope for me more than anything I hope that people who live in the areas that are going to be the home to the games in 10 years time they say do you know what I'm glad that 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 games happened because that's the reason why I get to work 10 minutes earlier or that's mm -hmm. the reason why they did something about the park that's the reason why they put the lights in that area where we've always wanted the lights so so I kind of hope more than the big you know grand the Commonwealth Games I, I more hope that the city is better as a result of the games being here and that also that you know there's a lot of skills programs and jobs programs that are coming to the city so I'd like to think in 10-15 years time there are kids who are teaching PE and they can say oh well you know the first thing I did was I volunteered at the Commonwealth Games and there are yeah. people who were who were leading uh, arts events and they're saying well, the first arts event I led was a little community event mm -hmm. that was that was tied under that that um, Commonwealth Games umbrella so I really hope it just provides opportunities and routes into their uh, employment and skills development for the young yeah. people of the city. Yeah, and likewise. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we've been looking at um, the transport infrastructure as one of our units yeah. and looking at, you know, we looked at Birmingham University as, as an example and all the things that have happened right there with cycle lanes and new train stations, I think that's amazing, you know, and if mm -hmm. that makes people's lives better in 2028 because of these games, then yeah. that's fantastic. And, and thanks for saying volunteering as well, because I keep telling my students, like, this is your chance. <laughs> you know, you're not yeah. going to have stupid people travelling from Bristol every day to to volunteer or people coming down from Glasgow yep. or something like get in there get it on your CV and uh, you know get into networking and, and the importance of knowing people um, because that's so crucial isn't it I mean how did you start networking there because obviously you've got quite a big <coughs> network now I would have thought uh -huh. um, but what if you're like 17 18 and, and I keep banging on about it and you keep saying it and everybody's like build your network build your network uh, how do you go about even starting that is it all online or is it face to face should you be going um, places I mean, how'd you do it? I think I think it's a weird it's a weird thing because I, I um, anyone people who know me people who work with me would say that I'm good at networking. But I, I hate the concept of networking um, because it feels very um, like transactional. It feels very much like I will get to know you because you could potentially do something for me in the future, and because of that, I might do something for you. And it doesn't feel very genuine. And a lot of the people who I've um, who I've worked with who have been really um kind of pivotal in opportunities that i've had and progress that i've had they're just people who i've spoke to because they they seem like nice people and i and i tend to speak to everyone <laughs> um i'm the kind of person oh thanks like, I was, yeah, you know, don't feel special. Oh. <laughs> well, I had 13 minutes of uh, living my life there, but hey, it's I've all got gone now. Podcast <laughs> just no, um, so, so I'm that kind of person. So if somebody says to me, um, Casey, we're doing this event, and anything about that event seems like something I 
um, resonate with or I want to see do well, mm. then people will say to me, okay, so, you know, we're doing this event, but, you know, we've basically got no budget. We're trying to raise some money for children doing this. I'll do the event. And in, in most cases, I'll just do that. And that's helpful for them. And we all go on about our business and that's great. And I feel good about it and they get something out of it. Mm. Every now and then what has happened is someone has said, oh, Casey, can you help me out with this? And I've gone, yeah, of course I can. And I help them out with that. And a year later, they go, oh, Casey, I'm actually running this project and we've got this really big budget for someone to come and write something. Oh, lovely. <laughs> that's yeah. worked out okay. <laughs> and I just think that ultimately it's, there's, you're always kind of, you're never at the top and you're very rarely at the bottom. So there's always someone who is bigger and has more connections in you and is more um, plugged in than you are. And there's always someone who is less so. And I think a lot of people make the mistake of they just look up all the time. So they get to the, the next level and they go, right, who can I kind of grab onto now to pull me up to the next level? And I just think it's much more rewarding to say, actually, I'm in this position. And because I'm in this position, for example, for me, I've got this gig that's going to be at the Symphony Hall. And they've said to me, well, which poets would you like to be on that gig? Now, the, the potentially smart thing to do would be to contact poets that I know that are a little bit bigger than me and go, yeah, but to the Symphony Hall. And they'll go, oh, yeah, we'll do it for the Symphony Hall. Mm -hmm. And I've helped them out. But I'd rather go, who are the poets that I think deserve the opportunity to be there mm -hmm. but haven't necessarily got the profile that, that they're going to get approached? Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is, is so much more rewarding because mm -hmm. you, you're putting someone in a position that they might not have been in if you hadn't been in the position that you're in. So yeah, I think yeah. for me, the key thing is, and I think a key part of why I've been successful, there are definitely poets who I think are better than me at poetry. <laughs> um, I think part of the reason why I've been successful is I, 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 I like to work with people and ultimately you can be really good at anything. And if people don't want to work with you and you don't want to work with people, at some point it's going to fall down because nine times out of 10, whatever you do, somebody else will do it. Yeah. so when he goes oh i really need a website designer and you go oh yeah you know you've got dave he designs websites yeah but dave was a bit standoffish when i met him and he wasn't really that engaging and he seemed a bit just too focused on the business side of things but there's that other guy isn't that michael he does websites as well there's always another person oh, yeah. who pretty much does what you do mm -hmm. um so we're all very unique but in terms of what we can offer somebody would normally be able to offer what you can offer so then why do i come to you um, and unless in a kind of business sense, unless it's because you're going to do it for way cheaper than anybody else, then it's because they want to work with you as a person or the people in your organisation or whoever it might be. Yeah, because of that reputation you've got and the image that you've got. And they know to a certain extent that if we work with this person, then we're going to get this from it and then it'll be worthwhile Absolutely. for us. I mean, how important then is it for your image? Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of the word authenticity is banded around a lot nowadays. Um, and obviously, you know, we all have our online personas and we have our real life personas. And then, you know, in your case, my case, we have to be teachers as well. Um, yeah. You know, I, I mean, do you, are you kind of focusing on your your kind of corporate brand of Casey Bailey? Or, <laughs> or are you, you know, or are you, or are you, I'm Casey Bailey, this is who I am? You know, uh, what, what's your yeah, brand I'm, like? I'm pretty much just I'm Casey Bailey. I'm who I am. What I, um, there are very few uh, kind of, in terms of the way that I communicate, if you see me with different groups of people, I communicate slightly differently. Um, and that's, I think that's more, I think it's just a, it's a natural thing. I think that, I think a lot of people see that as a negative thing, which I don't really mind. That's, you know, that's, that's for them to make that decision. But for me, I think communication should be effective. So there's no point in me talking to someone in a way that, that doesn't feel comfortable to them. Um, so I wouldn't walk into my head teacher's office at work and say, yo, fam, well gone. But I wouldn't walk in and see my mates and go, oh, hi, guys, is everyone all right? Because they'd be like, why are you talking like that? That might be how I talk to <laughs> might be able to talk to a year eight maths yeah. class um but at times in the year eight maths class i might talk to them in a way that none of their other teachers normally talk because ultimately i'm me and i'm going to slip into yeah, exactly. uh, and out of, of, of who i am what i think never changes is, is my core values so i'm not the kind of person who is going to sit down with a group of people who think one thing and act like i believe it and sit down with a group of people and think another thing and act like i believe it um and at times that means that the kind of concept of a corporate brand is tricky because there are things that I believe in that are they're not um, like then they're 
they're a bit marmite. They're a bit, mm. you know, well, you can't say that, or you you might alienate people if you say that. But those things to me are more important than than being accepted. It's more important yeah. that I say that you know you can't say this, or I won't I won't agree with that, or mm. I won't stay around somebody who holds these views than it is for me to be with those people. So yeah, so I think my core values never change, but I do slip in and out of the role and the the position that I'm in at the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I mean, you know, let's let's focus on the arts in terms of playing different roles and things like that, and and poetry, obviously, a big big part of your life. Um, how much of a challenge is it to to make a living from poetry for for people who are studying arts at the moment? And obviously, we we all know stories about arts funding in education, and um, obviously what COVID has done to the, the situation. I mean, how much of a challenge is it to to earn a living and be a poet if that's what what you want to do um it's hard like it's really tough and i think that um i think that what most almost every successful um whatever you might define successful as poet that i know mm. uh will say is that you know you you or i don't think there's anyone i can think of off the top of my head who just writes their poems and lives off their poems mm. because po poetry doesn't sell well enough for you to do that um and there's not necessarily the clamour for poetry um, for that to sustain um, kind of like a reasonable lifestyle for almost all poets. There are one or two, um, and in my experience, in fairness to them, the ones that I can think of are exceptional writers, um, but they're exceptional writers, they're charismatic people, they've been in the right place at the right time, they've networked well, there's a whole package around it, and there are still people who do all of that who can't make a what you would call a good living off, off writing poetry. Um, and I think that what people find is, you know, you write poetry, but you run poetry workshops. You go into schools and you work with kids. Some people go into prisons and they work with people. You work in community groups. You, um, you work alongside people who write for theatre, who write for television. Uh, a lot of poets end up going into writing novels because there's more money in writing novels. Well, that's, that's not fair. They maybe wanted to write novels, but ultimately to sustain a career as a writer, it's much more viable as a novelist. Um, and I think it's not impossible. And but I think the other thing to balance is a lot of people I know who are poets and are predominantly poets or or just totally poets in the same sense of, you know, workshops and, and that kind of their core thing comes from around the art of poetry. A lot of them could earn more money in another job. <clears throat> and they've accepted that they're not gonna have this much money and they're not gonna live this exact lifestyle, but actually they're gonna be really happy with what they do every single day of their life. They're gonna live somewhere where they're happy to live. And most poets that I know are not people who chase, you know, I don't, they're not people who are saying, oh, I wanna be a millionaire or blah, blah, blah. They want to make the best poetry that they can make. They wanna have an impact on people. A lot of them do want some kind of critical acclaim around that. No, I don't want to be a millionaire, but I do want to win, you know, the forward prize. <laughs> so there is that kind of, um, there is still a lot of ambition within those people, but their ambition doesn't tie up with the kind of common societal, like, oh, you know, how much do you earn? Where do you live? How, what car do you drive? It's more around, you know, actually, I'm just about to publish my sixth collection with this really prestigious publisher, and I'm really proud that they've yeah. published me and, you know, that kind of thing. So um, it's hard. Mm -hmm. Uh, for anyone I think part of the balance is is doing that more important than earning loads of money because as I say most of the poets that I know the skill of their writing they could write a lot of other things and earn more money they could work in a lot of different careers and earn more money but but they wouldn't necessarily be happy and I think some people um it, it's hard to grasp um the, the, the difference there, like the importance there of, of happiness and of actually being content unless you've ever really experienced it. So like for me as someone, so I teach because I love teaching mm -hmm. and I write poetry because I love writing poetry. Because of my kind of skill set from teaching, I could probably make more money going into schools doing poetry than I do actually teaching because, because you pay someone a lot more money to come in for the day yeah. than you pay the people that are there every day. Um, and, and such is the nature of the thing. But for me, the, the issue with that is I'll come in and I'll see that child who could do more support and then I'll leave yeah. and I don't know what happens next.
And what I'm passionate about is I can meet you when you're 11 years old and you're one person. And the impact that I have on your life could mean that when you're 18 years old, you're ready to do a whole different thing. Yeah. So, so I can't put a, a, a monetary value on the importance of that. And I think that's the key. If you want to write and you want to be an artist, you want to be creative, yes, you should get paid. Uh, yes, there are the opportunities for some people to be very well paid from it. Mm. But if you're doing it because you love it, then I would I believe that you will you would rather make half the money being a very good poet than you would working in an office doing a job that you don't really like. Yeah. And, and you know, knowing you've had a positive impact on someone truly is priceless. You know, a few it's, weeks ago, I would have said, oh, this sounds cheesy, but, and I've stopped myself saying that now, um, although ironically I did just say, it, but I, I have stopped myself saying that in terms of um, kind of almost apologizing for my feelings and my yeah, thoughts about yeah. that. But, and, and then I realized, why am I apologizing for that? Like, this is what I do all day, every day. I, I try to make yeah. an impact and try to make a difference, um, as do you. And, and there's nothing yeah. wrong with that. You know, you're allowed yeah. to do that. You don't have to drive to work in, in a Lamborghini and home in a Rolls Royce. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's fascinating. I mean, talking about the like the, the youngsters, so to speak, um, coming from a 41-year-old, obviously, um, how is technology changing your game? Have you seen a shift like in the last five years? Um, you know, are you having to do things differently because of technology, the importance of social media, that you almost have to be on it now, whether you like it or not? Has that changed anything for you? Um, I think, yeah, I think social media is a huge one. Um, and, and I've kind of grown up in a social media generation. So when I was... When I was a kid, we had MySpace and uh, that kind of thing. Um, so I've never been a poet. I've never, I've never been any kind of, I've never done any kind of work or anything of any um, like value outside of myself in a world where we didn't have social media. Okay. Um, but, uh, but what I can see is, you know, there are a lot of people who feel the need to be out there, the need to, to, to continue to engage because ultimately it does lead to things you know I, I know that prime example I put something on Twitter you responded to it we spoke in the Twitter DMs and here we are here and and that doesn't happen if I'm not on social media and it doesn't happen if you're not on social media but I think um what I like is there are a few people who have carved out like um like really cool personas for themselves based around the fact that they don't use social media so there's a poet from uh, Wolverhampton called Dave Pitt and like he's he's like locally known as Dave, not on Facebook Pit, because there was a period of time when people go, oh, I want to tag Dave, and he's not on Facebook. God, Dave's not on Facebook, and it's become a thing. Um, and like, so you'll find. So now he's on Twitter, but on Twitter he's on Twitter as Dave N O F B, not on Facebook Pit. Um, and I and I like that. I think that's a nice kind of yeah. um, thing where he's he's stuck to the fact that he's not on there and he's not going to go on there. And you can do that, but I do think it makes it a lot easier. Um, to engage and just kind of like collaborating, working with people. When I first started doing this and I wasn't, I didn't use Instagram, I didn't use Twitter. Now, you know, I've, there are people who I've worked with who are literally just, they tweeted something, I tweeted something, they followed me, I followed them and I realised, oh, hold on a minute, you do this, I do something like that. Oh, I think your work's great. Oh, funny you should say that because I really like what you did on this thing. And next thing you know, you've got a collaboration. Um, and, I'm, and I'm so unpicky on Twitter that my, my kind of criteria on Twitter is if somebody follows me or if I see a tweet from somebody and it says anything about education, poetry, writing, equality, <laughs> so many different things. Okay, yeah, follow. I, yeah. I want to know what you're saying. Um, and I'm not, I'm not looking for, you know, what level of writer are you? If you want any prizes, are you published? It's safe writer in your bio. I'm in. Yeah. I'm going to follow you because uh, you might write the best thing I've ever read. Um, so... Yeah, I think social media is huge in that respect. And what, what a fun way to discover new people and talents and ideas and sharing. Yeah. And it, it is absolutely fascinating. And you're right, you know, I wouldn't be doing any of this without social media. There's no way I would have known to contact half the people I have, including yeah. yourself. You know, even though we're, we're both in Birmingham, so I never would have gone, right, where does he live? If I could just pop <laughs> around his house and get him when he's in. You know, it's, it's, it's fascinating what we're able to do. I uh, absolutely love it. So, I mean, obviously COVID has, has had a massive impact on all of us goes without saying and not to belittle some of the things that have happened with COVID but for the art scene um, and, and theatre and cinema and shows and mu musicals and, and poetry and, and all of that 
obviously it's had a massive impact in Birmingham with it just stopping. Um, yeah. What's next? I mean, does it go back to what it was and in a year or two it's all just oh, exactly the same as it was? Or do you see, as somebody who's involved with that and talking to people, a bit of a shift towards kind of different ways of, of presenting that to audiences? What, what, what comes next for the arts in Birmingham? I, I think for the first time uh, ever, there is a genuine, um, genuinely useful conversation around accessibility because we've had in, in things going online, um, there, there, you know, there's been a lot of, uh, you know, not to make too fine a point of view, but trauma within the arts industry. Mm-hmm. There's been a lot of real suffering and struggling around uh, what people are going to do. What does this mean for them? Not just now, but it's highlighted the instability for a lot of people of something that they thought was very stable. Um, but a real kind of shining light in all of that is for all this time, there have been people who couldn't go to the theatre and, and, and really appreciate the show because they're deaf and there's not the provision for a deaf person at the show. There's not a, so there's not someone signing. You've got people who, there are theatres that still have accessibility issues. There have been poetry nights for years and years and years where you go into the cafe and you go up to the third floor on stairs and you know, someone shows up in their wheelchair and actually, how do I get up there to get involved? And now those people can can be at home and engage. You're watching the theatre, but it's got, it's got captions. You're sitting at home in your wheelchair watching the poetry night and you can perform now, you can share your poetry at a poetry night that you couldn't get into last year. Um, and I think that it's so important that we don't lose that. Um, and how do we balance that? Because I think there's a danger um, that people in control of those spaces will know that if I put this theatre production on and I put it on online, it's not just necessarily going to be people who couldn't get to the theatre who will watch it online. I might just go, oh, I'm not going to the theatre for sitting now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. I watch at home in my dressing gown, what am I yeah, going yeah. there for? Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think that they might put that above the genuine um, needs around access um, that people have. And so I hope that that doesn't happen. And I think there'll be a new kind of hybrid approach mm. to theatre, to some visual art, definitely to poetry there are a lot of poetry nights that are saying you know we're, we're never going offline again so it might be that the, the the poetry night is held in this coffee shop but there will be a camera set up and the whole thing will be live streamed yeah. and then I think that moves to and also you have the opportunity to to perform from home and we can set up a screen and yeah. and so I think that that that's part of what we'll see I also think you know during this time of the pandemic we've also had the the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement uh, within Britain. So then you're looking at um, things like the more than a more than a moment pledge and how do we make theatre and art spaces more equitable? What does that look like in terms of programming? What does that look like in terms of staff? So I think there are there are there are other things that have changed during this time uh, that will that will have an impact. Even some of the spaces. So Symphony Hall were obviously working on. They're new, they've got a new performance space, they've got a new entrance. Um, and they started that before the pandemic. And then we've gone through this whole period of the pandemic. And when we come out of it, Symphony Hall will open with a whole new set of spaces. So that will provide a new venue and a new set of opportunities for people. So I think there'll be a lot of, and some, some venues will have been lost and some nights will have been lost and some events will have been lost because people are not in a position um, to run them anymore. Is there a scope there to improve mental health as well as, as somebody who's, um, you know, as I, I have depression, I'm happy to talk about it. You know, the, the ability to be creative is, is a key part of it. There's something I very much enjoy doing these podcasts and doing other bits and pieces. Do, do you think there's a scope there then if people can get more involved a lot easier, that there's an opportunity to work for better mental health for people as well? I think there has to be because I think that we, we still... We, these things have, have for a long time just ran on the back of goodwill and often people run themselves into the ground making these things happen. And one of the things that has happened as well is around community, around people saying, actually, that night that you've ran for the last six years at such and such venue, you know, if you're going to run it online, I'll run it next month if you want me to, I'll mm. curate it. I'll, and I think there's a, the, the chance for that kind of collaborative approach to things and looking out for each other to just follow on going forward. And I think more of us have realized how, how quickly isolation 
can turn very difficult for each other. And I think we're more acutely aware that actually we need to check up on each other. We need to look out for each other because in a period of time when a lot of people say, no, I haven't seen my friends for a year and a half. Some of them friends you didn't see for a year and a half before. <laughs> you know, you didn't, you haven't seen them. You really, yeah. really, you haven't seen them That's for three right. years. <laughs> yeah. and it could get gone. awkward really quick, couldn't it? Once people yeah. say that, yeah, but you didn't call me since 2018 yeah. anyway. Yeah, so. you, weren't, you weren't calling me. <laughs> so I think that the, we, we now need to be more aware when we can be around our people, when we can look out for each other. It's, it's much more important probably than we realised. Um, and I think the, the generation um, that, that I've kind of grew up in is grew up on this kind of romanticising, like, oh, well, we're friends, but we don't even need to see each other and we're still friends. That's lovely, but wouldn't it be nice if we were friends and we saw each other? <laughs> wouldn't yeah, wouldn't like that be <laughs> um, So I think there's definitely scope for that um, and understanding around that to change the way that we treat each other and look out for each other. Yeah, very important. Very important we do that. So, I mean, as we roll towards the end here then, uh, what's next for you then? We've spoke about what's next for the arts, but what about yourself? You said you're on the board for Commonwealth Games Legacy. Uh, what what else is coming up for, for yourself then, Casey? So... Um, quite a few things really soon actually so I've, worked, I've been working on a project called insect safari which is um a very funny project to be a part of and i'm, I'm so excited about what it's going to be but basically it's like a it's like puppetry but the insects are like the size of like horses like they're huge um and, and you've sold me already me, i can I just see my daughter in the crowd already she's like yeah, Dad, as we, soon as we I heard about it, as soon as I heard about it, I was like, "Can I bring my son? Never mind the fee or anything. <laughs> yeah. Can I bring my son because he's going to love this? Yeah, um, and I'm secretly going to love it as well. But can I? Oh yeah, yeah, same. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so I've written some stuff for that. So I've been one of three um, poets writing on that, which I kind of can't wait to see the whole final piece. Um, that's with an organisation called Fetch Theatre. I'm working with the Birmingham Royal Ballet on a project called City of a Thousand Trades. Um, which is um, a dance and poetry collaborative um, piece of work and theatre. Uh, my own play that I wrote called Grime Boy, although I'm, still, I'm always, always still writing these things. This is what anyone who's listening who's a writer, until someone's got a hard copy of it in their hands, fully bound with an official cover. It's still being written. It's not finished. Um, <laughs> so, so I've got Grime Boy, which was meant to come onto stages in 2021 and, and go on at Coventry Belgrade, Birmingham mm -hmm. Rep, and and a few other uh, theatres. It is coming to theatres, but it'll be 2022 now. Um, and I have got my book, which comes out in uh, about a month. Wait there, hold that thought. Oh. So my book, Chicky Plug, there we go. please do not touch. <laughs> there we go. Uh, that Lovely. will be out. Um, yeah, June the 6th is the official release date so awesome well that's like yeah. less than about two weeks <laughs> that's yeah, not, yeah, that's not right. long at all so where, where are we going to get a copy of that from is that uh, uh is that so it will be in bookstores it will be on the burn and i books website it will be on my website it'll be on the waterstones website so really? yeah just just google it and you'll find it we'll the find joys it. of technology casey bailey please do not touch there we go. Well, we'll find that. Good grief. Well, I, I knew you wouldn't say nothing to that question. You know? <laughs> <laughs> What's next? I'm sure that's probably the shortened version of that. You're probably thinking, well, next year I've got this. You know? yeah. So, uh, you know, thanks for keeping it short and sweet for us. That's brilliant. So thank you so much. Um, let me ask you one last question, and if you don't mind, um, which I ask everybody. And that question is, if you could go back to when you were 17, 18 and give Casey some advice to for when he was 17, 18, like a lot of my students and a lot of our listeners and watchers are, um, what would that advice have been that you wish you stuck to or kind of used as a mantra as you went forward? Um, I think, so I, I always say, because I've been asked this question before, and I always say I wouldn't give myself any advice. And I say that because like, I'm a firm believer that every step that you take leads to where you are. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily change anything. However, if you're 17 or 18 and you're listening and you haven't made all the mistakes that I've made, don't make them for the fun of it. Um, <laughs> my advice would be, um, I think a lot of people suffer with believing that they're not good enough for things. So they don't yeah. go, they don't apply for things. They don't put themselves forward. You know, if you're a writer, you don't send your work off to anyone. Uh, in business, you don't apply for the job that you want or anything like that. Um, I would always say that somewhere there is someone half as good as you getting twice as much credit or money or attention or value because they got out of their own way 
and they didn't say maybe I'm not good enough. They said, well, I think I am good enough. So I, I would say if you want something, go for it. And the very worst that can happen is you don't get it, which is exactly what happens if you don't try. So you'd rather have a 99% chance of failure than a 100% chance of not getting what you wanted. So go for it. And if you don't get it, well, you wouldn't have got it if you never tried anyway. Exactly. Yeah. Is, is that kind of like the imposter syndrome but we that I hear bandied about a lot? You know, I hear yeah. a lot of people imposter saying I have syndrome. imposter syndrome. Is that, yeah. is that it? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. So, okay. So, Casey, thank you so much. You know, I really thank do appreciate you. you taking the time to talk. Um, stay on the line for a second afterwards. We'll say a proper cheerio. Um, but, you know, your words and wisdom. And uh, all I can do is wish you all the best for, for all your ventures. That book sounds fascinating. We'll, we'll get pick up a copy myself. Um, right. Yeah. And looking forward to keeping in touch and see what you uh, you end up doing. Because no doubt it's going to be lots of it. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah. <laughs> thanks, Casey. Uh, we'll say cheerio thank for you. now. And uh, thanks very much for talking business. Really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Casey, for taking the time to chat here on Talking Business. There's a lot of inspiration we can all take from that. And I hope that you're right in terms of what's coming next for Birmingham and the arts. So, Casey, cheers. Thank you very much. Really, really appreciate it. And to everybody else watching and listening, then you can say hi on the social medias. Have a look for Pardo's Business or Mr. Pardo's Business, and you'll find me all on those. And until next time, when I hear or see you again on another episode of Talking Business with Danny Pardo. Thank you very much. Cheerio. Bye-bye.